We just had college football week seven, and uh, there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk about. Number one, we'll start with the, I guess, the number one team in the nation. Number one, Georgia beat number 11, Kentucky, 30 to 13. Georgia is now 7-0. and They will play Florida next week. That'll be fun. I think it's a neutral site game. I believe that game always happens in Jacksonville. It has as long as I've been paying attention. Uh, that Again, that'll be fun. Georgia, Florida, it's always fun. It's always interesting. Georgia probably wins. Kentucky's only hope of winning this game against Georgia over the weekend was somehow having Georgia quarterback Stetson Bennett have a bad game. He did not. In fact, he actually had a great game. Stetson Bennett was 14 for 20 passing, 250 yards, three touchdowns, made a lot of really good throws. And I, I maintain it looks like Stetson Bennett probably should be the long-term starting quarterback at Georgia. Like, he's playing really free. He's letting the ball fly, making great throws downfield. Uh, one of the guys he threw to, Brock Bowers, the Georgia tight end, had five catches for 105 yards and two touchdowns. Again, man, Stetson Bennett made big-time throws in the tight windows downfield. I was very, very impressed. Now, I have to talk about this because Kentucky had a crazy drive at the end of the fourth quarter. They had a 22-play, 75-yard touchdown drive. It took 11 minutes and 23 seconds off the clock. In fact, the only reason why it ended at 11 minutes and 23 seconds was because the game ran out of time and they had to score literally as the clock ran out. So the drive took up basically the entire fourth quarter. And they, in fact, they had two fourth down conversions in that on that drive at the end of the game. It made me wish that Kentucky had gone for it more on fourth down throughout the game. Now, I looked at their fourth downs. I'm like, well, a lot of them were deep in their own territory or fourth and long. But it's hard to tell. Did Kentucky have a breakthrough at the end of this game? Or did Georgia just, eat, just ease off a little bit and you know let their foot off the gas and allow just like hey we'll, we'll give Kentucky four yards there five yards there it's very either one seems possible but I wonder it just doesn't I, I can't say like it, it makes me wonder a little bit did Kentucky have a breakthrough and figure something out at the end of the game that maybe they could have done all game that like, if Kentucky plays Georgia again tomorrow do they do better or do worse it's just something I'd love to think about we'll never know the answer but. Either way, like despite losing, I felt like Kentucky actually played very, very well. Kentucky, I, I think, is going to go 11-1 and one this year. feels very likely. It feels very possible. And uh, keep your eye on Kentucky, man. I think they're, they're a great football program doing good stuff. And uh, Georgia right now is the team to beat in college football. Now, Cincinnati beat UCF. There, at the time, Cincinnati was the number three team in the nation. Cincinnati won 56-21 to 21 over Central Florida. It's almost a given that Cincinnati is going to make it into the college football playoff. I would be shocked if they somehow lost this year. They play like SMU who's ranked at some point later, but I mean, look, Cincinnati is a, it's a cool story. I, I want to see them make it into the college football playoff. They're a group of five team who is kind of getting ranked up with the big boys, which is really fun. Now in this game, Cincinnati running back Jerome Ford, he deserves credit. He carried the ball 20 times for a hundred and 89 yards and four touchdowns. So Cincinnati, they remain undefeated, and uh, their quest to make it into the college football playoff continues. Will they win? Probably not, but I'm like, hey, they're a cool story. I don't mind following that. Oklahoma beat TCU 52-31. to This is another team in the college football playoff conversation. Now, Spencer Rattler, the Oklahoma quarterback, or, or, or former Oklahoma starting quarterback, has now officially been benched because... Caleb Williams is the new quarterback starting at Oklahoma. He had five total touchdowns, four passing, one rushing. One of that, that one rushing touchdown was a 41-yard run by Caleb Williams. It was very impressive. He was 18 for 23 passing for 295 yards uh, and those four touchdowns passing that I did mention. Caleb Williams is uh, – man, I'm becoming a really big fan of the guy. I like his demeanor. His teammates seem to like him. He seems like a good leader who is just very positive and – I love watching Caleb Williams play quarterback. The way he sits in the pocket is very calm and strong. It's very unique the way he, like his feet are very deliberate, very slow, but not slow because he's like slow, slow because they're controlled. And it's just a different style, a different tempo you don't often see where he's not bouncing his feet around a lot. He's just very calm, very strong, very slow. And watch the way Caleb Williams uses his lower body to generate force with the football. It's really impressive. And, I got to say, Caleb Williams reminds me a lot of, he has parts of his game that are taken from two different former Oklahoma quarterbacks. One is he runs a lot like Jalen Hurts, 
powerful but quick. Uh, but man, like Caleb Williams can really lower the shoulder and break a tackle, which I, I love Kyler Murray. He never could do that. But then he throws the ball like Kyler Murray. He's got Kyler Murray's ability to throw the ball. He runs like Jalen Hurts. Caleb Williams is fantastic. I love the guy. And uh, it's just, I cannot wait to watch him continue to progress and grow. Like, he's not perfect. He's a little late on a couple throws and still figuring it out. But definitely, it's it's undeniable, in my opinion, that Oklahoma is a much better team with Caleb Williams as their starting quarterback. And it makes me wonder, I look back to you know some of the ugly wins that Oklahoma had earlier in the year. Would those games have been blowouts if Caleb Williams had played all year? I, I don't know. I, I think you had to let the Spencer Rattler thing play out, but certainly Caleb Williams is fantastic. Now, I still worry about Oklahoma's defense. They gave up 31 points to TCU. Uh, TCU receiver Quinton Johnson had seven catches for, listen to this, 185 yards and three touchdowns. That's ridiculous. Uh, so, I like, in the college football playoff, can Oklahoma stop an SEC team? I doubt it. And and if, certainly if they match up with Cincinnati, that's like the dream scenario. Can we get Cincinnati against Oklahoma? Because that's a game that Cincinnati has a legitimate shot. They probably don't win, but they have a better shot of beating Oklahoma than they do of beating Alabama or Georgia. So keep your eye on that. I'm curious how things all play out. Now, Iowa lost. Number two Iowa lost to unranked Purdue uh, they're called the Purdue Boilermakers. I would call them the Purdue Spoilermakers after beating. Sorry, it's dumb. It's cheesy. I saw that comment all over YouTube. I had to steal it. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, was it 2018? Was it two years ago? I don't remember. Recently, Purdue beat number two Ohio State. And, and Purdue was unranked at the time. They spoiled their year as well. Now, this game was not even close. Purdue beat Iowa at Iowa 24 to 7. It was embarrassing, and I would say that Iowa got exposed. Their weakness, which is their starting quarterback, kind of caught up to them. Their quarterback, Spencer Petras, had four interceptions. It was really only three. The final interception, number four, came at the very end of the game on the final play. But still, like, you look at Iowa, what they did, they really only had two good drives all game. They missed a field goal, and they put together a touchdown drive earlier in the game. Uh, look, man, I never understand why a top high school quarterback— doesn't seek out Iowa and say, hey, I want to go to Iowa and be the man. Because it feels like Iowa is always just a, like one legit quarterback away from being a really good program winning a lot of games. Like they run the ball super well. They play great defense. It seems like all they need is one NFL level quarterback. If they could find that, like imagine if Iowa had Fresno State quarterback, Jake Hayner. If, If Jake Hayner was at Iowa, Imagine what would happen. Him running hard play action, turning around, reading a defense. Like, he'd be fantastic. Or imagine if, this is like a dream of dreams, but this is, like, if you play NCAA, this is what you should do, really. Imagine if Oklahoma quarterback Spencer Rattler transferred into Iowa. His talent, his playmaking ability, his bad attitude, too, I acknowledge that. But him, with that running game and that defense, would be outstanding and really fun to watch. It just, I mean, it kind of reminds me of Russell Wilson in Wisconsin. When Wisconsin played great defense, ran the ball well, all they needed was a really good quarterback. And Iowa, every year, had this feeling like, man, all they need is a great quarterback, and they never seem to have one. Maybe that's coaching, by the way, but it, it is still infuriating to watch year in and year out watching Iowa football. Now, anyway, Purdue played really, really well. Uh, it's not, again, it's not the first time. So it was, in my notes, 2018, Purdue beat number two Ohio State. Uh, They were unranked. They knocked off the number two team in the nation. Uh, And I just credit to Purdue. Their quarterback played very, very well. But the story here really is that Iowa has fallen. On top of that, Alabama crushed Mississippi State 49-9. to Mississippi State could not even score a touchdown in this game. Their quarterback had three interceptions. I wonder, hey, hey, Mississippi State fans, how is the Mike Leach era going? Just wondering, just asking a question. I think they're three and three. Like, I remember when I said, uh, I I got a lot of hate from Mississippi State fans when they hired Mike Leach. And I said, look, he's going to be interesting. He's never going to beat Alabama. And we see the gap now. Alabama beat Mississippi State 49 to nine. Like, we'll see. But I, I wonder how happy Mississippi State Bulldog fans are with their coach currently. I don't know. 
Now, a lot of people, I heard people say all week, this is what they said roughly. After Alabama lost, it opens up the door for other teams. And people on ESPN and Fox Sports, they all just say that because they want to sell college football. They want it to sound exciting and they want it to sound like everyone has a real chance. No, no one. Sorry. It, when Alabama lost, nothing happened. It changed nothing. I was like one of the only people that's like, well, I actually think Alabama might win the national championship now because of that loss. Look at the new rankings today. Most rankings have, like, if you look at almost every poll, the top four is some order and some ranking of Georgia number one, then either Cincinnati or Oklahoma two. But still, the top three is always Georgia, Cincinnati, Oklahoma. And guess who the number four team in the nation is right now? Two weeks removed from losing to Texas A&M, or maybe one week, depending on how you count it. Alabama is the number four team in the nation on almost every poll nationwide. Oh, it's almost like Alabama never lost. Just saying, like, it's kind of funny. If Alabama wins the SEC title, that loss to Texas A&M isn't going to matter at all. And look, Cincinnati's probably going to get in. Cincinnati has a, a great shot because the Pac-12 has nobody and the ACC has no dominant team to represent them. Like the Pac-12, almost at 10, the Pac-12 has number, in, Oregon's ranked number 10 in basically every poll. So they have Oregon, who's got a one, got one loss. They lost to Stanford. And then right now, the highest ranked team out of the ACC is Wake Forest. That is not going to stay pat. And the Pac-12 and ACC cannot put together a team to represent them at the top. So it's more and more likely we're going to see Cincinnati get in, which is very exciting to me. I like seeing a new face like that. I also wonder how cool would it be if Michigan right now is undefeated. They're six and L. They play Northwestern next week, and even if they beat Northwestern, you know Michigan still has to beat Michigan State, their rival, the Spartans. They have to beat Penn State and Ohio State. But how cool would it be if Michigan ran the table and made it in like that? That's one of those things that gets me. They probably wouldn't win. But man, I, I would love to see that. A, a this would be like a dream Final Four. It would be like Michigan, Oklahoma, Cincinnati, and then either Georgia or Alabama. That sounds wild and different and unique and fun. Like we haven't had a college football playoff with teams like that. And like I know Oklahoma gets in, but Oklahoma never wins anything in those games. And uh, man, it'd be it'd be really really fun to see that. By the way. Speaking of Michigan, Michigan State just beat Indiana. They're now 7-0. So Michigan State has a bye week next week. Then they play Michigan in two weeks from now. That's the, They play for the Paul Bunyan Trophy, the Michigan-Michigan State game. If Michigan beats Northwestern next weekend, then we're going to get that Paul Bunyan game between two undefeated teams, 7-0 Michigan and 7-0 Michigan State. I want that so badly. Oh, man, I really want to see... That I, for, I don't know why. I'm obsessed with that idea that we're going to get... It's always interesting. It's always fun. By the way, Jim Harbaugh always struggles to beat Michigan State. It's always interesting and weird. Remember one time, Michigan had the win. They're punting the ball away, and they messed up the punt. It got blocked or stole whatever happened, and it gave Michigan State a touchdown. They lost that way on, like, the final play of the game. So every year, Michigan has trouble with Michigan State. It should be fun. It should be interesting, and... uh I'm, I'm so pumped for that storyline. What's going to happen with Michigan, Michigan State this year? I'm like, oh, can we please get them both 7-0 going into that game? Now, also uh, this past weekend, LSU beat number 20 Florida 49-42. to Florida 2, 4 to 2. Florida threw four interceptions between two different quarterbacks in this game. LSU led for most of the game. Like, Florida got up, they were up 6 to nothing, and then they couldn't score after that. Uh, Florida freshman quarterback Anthony Richardson uh, played has played a decent amount this year. In this game against LSU, he played the most he's played all year. In my opinion, moving forward, Anthony Richardson should be the full-time starting quarterback of Florida moving forward. And I bet a lot of angry Florida fans are calling for Dan Mullen's job, the Florida head coach. I would relax. I think you just got to wait and let... Like Florida has basically Emory Jones, who's not a very good quarterback, and they're basically waiting until Anthony Richardson can be the full-time starting quarterback. He's a freshman. He's still developing. But once you figure out the quarterback situation, Florida's going to be just fine. And also, let's be honest. Like, there's no—no no matter who the coach is at Florida, 
they're not going to dethrone Nick Saban in Alabama anytime soon. You got to let it happen naturally. Uh, really what Florida needs to do is be patient. Stop calling for the coach's job. I, I don't know what coach can come into Florida and beat Alabama quickly. I just don't like Urban Meyer is a pipe dream and nothing else even sounds feasible. So can we stop with the fire Dan Mullen thing? It's getting weird. And I like maybe Mario Cristobal comes from Oregon, but I don't know why he would leave Oregon. He's got a great thing. He's on top of the world. He commands that conference. So I don't know, man. Now, a weird note here is that LSU announced that they have fired their head coach, Ed Orzeron. And it's weird. They did it after winning a big game against Florida. It's like, what? Very bizarre. Now, apparently they have agreed that Ed Orzeron will coach for the rest of the year and then leave, which I, I've i never really heard of that before, where they agree early he's going to be done. Usually that doesn't work out very well. Uh, remember, Coach O won them a national title. Now, a lot of people would argue that Joe Burrow and Joe Brady won them a national title, but still it's, I don't know, man. Like, I, I get it. Like, Coach O hasn't done much since winning that national title, but I, I hope LSU has a plan. Like, what what's their plan after Coach Orzeron? I don't know because are they going to bring back Joe Brady as head coach? Maybe that's their plan. I don't know, but LSU, like, they're, it feels like they're losing a good coach, searching for something better, and I don't know that there really is much better on the horizon. I would feel terrible if LSU fired at Orzeron and then was awful the next couple of years. Like, that would be interesting and funny. Now, you would argue, is that really better than Coach O? I don't know, but Coach O, again, he won you a national title. Most coaches are not going to do that for you. So, um, I don't know. I feel like a little bit of respect should have been given more to Ed Orzeron. By the way, number 12 Oklahoma State beat number 25 Texas 32-24. to Texas, man. Texas had... A 24 to 16 lead in the fourth quarter. Texas did not score in the fourth quarter. Let me uh, let me rephrase that. Texas could not score in the fourth quarter of this football game, and uh, it's like, man, Texas, another blown lead. Now, I want to say there's one person at Texas I love. Bijan Robinson is an NFL running back. He's a guy reminds me a lot of Devin Singletary, the Bills starting running back. He's a guy who's going to be, if he's not a first-round pick, he's a second-round pick. He's going to be a, a franchise running back for whoever drafts him in the NFL. He had 21 carries for 135 yards, two touchdowns in this game. He's run for, like, I think 10 touchdowns and 930 yards in just a couple games, in seven, six, six, seven games this year, however many they've played at Texas. And uh, B. John Robinson, I got the numbers inaccurate, or imprecise, but I, the point is he's fantastic this year. I really like watching him. He can run. He can catch. I love Love watching B. John Robinson. Now, Oklahoma State is undefeated. They're 6-0. and And there are five games between now and Bedlam. Bedlam is the Oklahoma versus Oklahoma State rivalry game. And uh, between now, Oklahoma State plays at Iowa State, Kansas, then at West Virginia, then TCU, then at Texas Tech. Those are not easy wins, but they also are all winnable games for Oklahoma State. So, I wonder, can Oklahoma State go into that Oklahoma game undefeated? And I feel pretty confident that when Oklahoma leaves the Big 12 for the SEC, OK State, Oklahoma State has an opportunity there to dominate the Big 12 once their big brother leaves the conference. So, man, I just, I'm excited for the future of Oklahoma State. I think they're going to be a very good program and they've got a bright future ahead of them. Another game, Auburn beat number 17. Arkansas. I want to ramble and rant about one game, one play real quick. Right before halftime, Arkansas called a jump pass, and Arkansas's quarterback, uh, KJ Jefferson, jumps up. It's not there, so he lands, which normally on a jump pass, if you don't throw the ball, you're in big trouble. He lands after jumping, runs to the left a little bit, then goes, oh my gosh, someone's open in the end zone, and just fires the ball into the end zone for a touchdown. It's very rare you see a jump pass recovered as well as K.J. Jefferson did in that moment. Now, they didn't win the game, but that was a, a big play that really stood out to me in my mind. Uh, I love Auburn quarterback. Love is a strong word. I really like Auburn quarterback Bo Nix. I, I, one of the things I can't wait to do this offseason is dive into Bo Nix's film. I'll watch it leading up to the 2022 NFL Draft. I'll do a film analysis at some point. I am so excited to watch the film. I think there's potential there. Every time I watch Bo Nix, I go, huh. Good athlete, can run, got a good arm, makes some good throws. And I, I don't know that he's NFL ready yet, but I also don't know that he couldn't become a better NFL quarterback. So 
I, I'm really, I'm just fascinated by Bo Nix. I really, really like him, and I like the idea of him. Now, Arkansas did not play great in this game. Um, they had a couple bad calls on defense, and I don't mean penalties or, I mean, like, bad play calls and, and bad calls on defense where, for example, at the end of the game, it was like second and 14, Auburn's trying to run at the clock, and it was on Bo Nix's touchdown at the end of the game to kind of seal the victory for Auburn. For some reason, in a an obvious running situation, Arkansas left the box wide open. They only had five men in the box. You know, Auburn spread it wide, ran a quarterback draw, and uh, it, it was. I mean, I just, it was baffling. I'm like, why, how do you not expect Auburn to run the ball there with Bo Nix? It was really weird. And uh, for some reason, I, I just was blown away. Like uh, Arkansas made a couple decisions like that on defense, where I'm like, hmm, you don't deserve to win this game at all. Now. It was a great win for Auburn. It was a great win for their head coach, Brian Harson. He is a guy who Auburn has a history of getting every SEC team does this. They get impatient. The fire coaches really quickly. Brian Harson certainly he's no Nick Saban, but he's doing a very good job building that program at Auburn. And he, he came in from Boise state. I really like him and I hope they give him more time because I think Brian Harson's doing a pretty good job building that Auburn program. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about number 13, Ole Miss beat, Tennessee, uh, by the way, on the road at Tennessee, their stadium is fan- like, it's massive. I love, I love the atmosphere and it was pretty cool during pregame Lane Kiffin acknowledged like, yeah, they don't like me, but he also was weirdly complimentary of Tennessee fans. He's like, look, these people are passionate. It's what makes college football great. And I got to get like Lane Kiffin is right there. You know, college football is better and every kind of sporting event is better when fans care. Now, you could argue the fans took it a little bit far in this game. At the end of this game, it was crazy. First of all, with one minute left on 4th and 24, Tennessee threw the ball for basically 23 and a half yards. And they got called short. They reviewed it. They said it's it's short and ruled a turnover on downs. The crowd hated that call. And they just began to mutiny. They were so angry. They started throwing stuff on the field. And uh, like a golf ball hit Lane Kiffin, the Ole Miss head coach. And it literally caused a 20-minute delay. And it was weird because there was only 54 seconds left in the game. But it took 20 minutes to solve everything and get some fans kicked out and before they could resume the game. It's like, man, the end of this game was so long and drawn out. And I got to say, that's one thing that I I prefer to watch football games at home. And one thing is that it, I'm being a little bit dramatic, but I do I do get a bit weirded out by the mob mentality of, like, When people are in a big group, they do stuff they wouldn't normally do, like start launching mustard bottles on the field. And uh, that idea that a crowd can turn against you and it's kind of a mob mentality, it makes me feel uneasy. I don't like that. And I certainly, I got that feeling watching this end of the Tennessee game. I'm like, oh, this is a bit uncomfortable. Now, remember, there's bad blood between Lane Kiffin and Tennessee. Lane Kiffin was briefly, in 2009, the head coach at Tennessee. Well, he left. He After one year, he left to be the head coach at USC. And I got to say, another weird part of this game, Tennessee almost threw a touchdown, which would have been the game-winning touchdown with four seconds left. The ball went through a receiver's hands in the end zone, and you're like, oh, if you're Lane Kiffin, the, uh, the, uh, the Ole Miss head coach, you're just like, oh, I can't believe he got away with that one. And then on the final play, the most baffling thing happened. Tennessee's quarterback, Milton, I believe is his name, just ran out of bounds. He's extending a play. Instead of throwing the ball to the end zone like you're... I, at, it's the end of the game, dude. Throw the ball up. Like, who? you throw a pick, who cares? You got nothing to lose. He didn't even throw the ball to the end zone. He just ran out of bounds. And I'm like, man, what a, what a weird ending to this game. You have the step thrown on the field, and then you have this quarterback who doesn't seem to want to throw the ball into the end zone. He just runs out of bounds, accepting a loss. Like, did he not know how much time is left? Did he panic? Did he just have a mental breakdown? I have no idea, but... Uh, my goodness, uh, the whole game between Ole Miss and Tennessee was very, very bizarre. And, uh, and Ole Miss won, but in the most bizarre way. Uh, and just about the most bizarre ending in college football I've seen in quite a while. 